Welcome to this homemade edition of Showcase. Today we have artistic social distancing, adult gamers and Bye Bye Art Basel 2020. The Rolling Art Project in Tel Aviv is helping artists come together while keeping them socially distant. And instead of me telling you about it, I have Anna Bord, the co-founder of Rollo with me. Hi, thank you so much for joining Hi. us. So it sounds like a really interesting project. I mean, this um, chain emailing, uh, you know, and then all, all the online exhibition that follows it. Tell me how the project started. What was your intention behind this? So the all intention of this uh, project that I'm running with my um, colleagues um, is to create a real um, communication between, between people. Okay. And the thing is, uh, before COVID-19, we used to arrange um, cultural salon events, which was a very easy way to make people uh, meet new people and talk to each other and make these connections. But with uh, the out outbreak of this virus, it was um, impossible to have these uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've come up with this idea of the Rolling Art Project uh, with this intention of how to make people that are at their homes with the social distancing uh, during a quarantine um, connect each other. So we thought um, we will, if we'll do it through art, um, it will help uh, artists uh, talk. So the idea is uh, starting with a, with a word or a, a subject that we pass forward to an artist and uh, he has 20, he or she has uh, 24 hours to create a new um, artwork based on, uh, on the subject that, uh, that we've chosen. Mm -hmm. And afterwards we get a new artwork and we are passing it forward to another artist who now gets 24 hours to create his new artwork. And through this many different chains that we've created first here in Tel Aviv and now um, going back and for forward with Turkish artists, um, we create this communication. The, the artists are talking to each other each other through the works. Okay, but artists don't really know each other, do they? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know each other at all. And furthermore, they do not know whose work are they getting via email. They're just getting uh, an artwork and all they know is the work and they have 24 hours to come up with their artwork. Okay, why do you think it is important to do it this way? I mean, an artist, especially uh, in a quarantine uh, mood, they would just, you know, create artworks mostly because they don't really mind, you know, being lonely or, you know, being bored, etc. So why do you think it's important that artists really talk to each other through their works? So actually, uh, I had this assumption also that artists uh, are already... Uh, um, spending their time in quarantine doing art, but with this project we've all uh, found out it's not really like this. Because of this global stress, because of this new uh, situation, many artists uh, were lacking of inspiration. They didn't know what to do, where to begin with, and they also didn't have the usual uh, frames they used to work for. There are no museums suddenly, no uh, public uh, spaces to exhibit your work or whatever, no purpose. It's just being s swimming in the unknown. And this project, and we got this from many, many artists, they've told us um, that um, they got inspired with the work that we've sent them. And also the time limit, we were not sure, like maybe 24 hours, it's not enough time to create an an artwork but you know artists sometimes if you don't limit them they can not only take their time they can also get very insecure and if they have more and more time to to think about it they sometimes overthink it and then their art never sees the light of day so we got this from many artists that during COVID they didn't have any inspiration they didn't have any frame and this project gave them both of this um, aspects I mean, I just assumed, I think, in my previous question that the works really uh, speak to each other. But do you see that or do you feel like, you know, they're not really related in a very direct sense? And that is maybe the beauty of the project. I don't know. What is your uh, opinion on this? 
I think we can see it in many, many works, and it, it even pops out more when the mediums are very different. Uh, when someone um, is uh, writing a, a song and, uh, and rec recording it, and then someone paints a picture related to the song, uh, you can see, maybe you don't see the, uh, the connection, but in, especially in this kind of works, it, it pops out. And I think you can really see it in the, in the project we did um, with Turkey, with the initiative of uh, Elazar Zingval, the cultural attaché, and uh, with the help of uh, King Cohen from um, Mahmoud Project. Uh, you can really see how the Israeli and the Turkish artists are almost creating one artwork um, made of very different pieces, but the connection is so vivid. Mm -hmm. It's quite incredible. Okay, and finally, I mean, you worked with Turkish and Israeli artists. I mean, what's Israeli or what's Turkish about these chains? Or it, is it just the, I mean, is the geographical uh, component just about artists' um, backgrounds? Uh, I think um, it, it has two aspects. I think the first one is that it shows that artists will do art no matter where they're, they're from, and even though they don't speak the same language, they talk through art. Um, and it is quite incredible to see. I really find it very interesting. There is one work, um, it's called uh, Armless, of an Israeli artist, and it's a shirt. It's a, uh, it's a photograph of a blouse. It's black and white, so people don't know that this um, shirt is um, I, the... the top of a uh, army uniform mm -hmm. uh, but black and white takes out this connotation and the next work of a Turkish artist um, has this um, very um, shiny shirt which has only cloth on the arms and nothing here and you can see how it really creates a new um, um, a new thing yeah. through talking to each other through the topic of the shirt that has the, a, a larger connotation. That's lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today on board. So, while many of us continue to self-quarantine, you might assume that someone who's a novelist and a journalist would recommend us to read a few books, but not Caroline or Dana who she wants us adults to play video games. And now let's just talk about it. Hi, how are you, Caroline? Good Hi. to see you. I love my introduction. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm against literacy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll make you explain that. Uh, what does it mean and why do you think playing video games is a good quarantine activity? I'm not doing it. Why should I do it? Please convince me. Well, to be honest, this started like I'm a huge reader. I'm a novelist. I write books. My business is books. It's the kind of, of all the cultural things that one can do, it is the thing I'm most plugged into the rest of the time. Um, and I'm very good at knowing when the next books are coming out and who is the authors that we should be watching. It's very much my hobby, it's my industry, it's my everything. So I am very much pro-literacy. But I was um, <laughs> finding, particularly at the beginning of lockdown, my concentration levels were absolutely shot. Um, and I think that was a response that lots and lots of people have been having, particularly people who are in creative professions, which is that they, um, apparently what happens in a time of crisis is that it stimulates a flight or flight response in your brain, which means you, you kind of, you're unable to think kind of creatively, creatively, you're focused on things that aren't necessary for survival, are very short and very limited. And so I found myself, I was picking up novels and then within like a minute, I was just veering over to my phone to check the, the latest like death tally or whatever. Um, or it'd be the same. I would put on some wonderful film on Netflix and within minutes, my phone, my hand, I, I couldn't even control it or even notice I was doing it. I was just in my social media absorbing all of this um, panic that was mm -hmm. making, was amounting so much that I had anxiety all the time and I think lots of people did and also these people who are constantly towards, especially towards the beginning of the pandemic, constantly just looking at me like, oh god, do I have it or am I just having a panic attack? And so what I loved about gaming and um, I have a Nintendo Switch, that's kind of my preferred, my preferred console, is that 
it engages everything. It's like it's like you know those horses that you see with the blinkers on. Yeah. Um, it's like that. You, your your hands are both of your hands are busy. Your eyes are busy. Your ears are busy. You're responding to all of it, and it's just you get to disappear into this little hole for like two to four hours in an evening. And then it's like it's almost like a bubble is around you and nothing can kind of touch you. Mm-hmm. And strangely, my my boyfriend who lives with me, and you know, we live in a one bedroom apartment in London and we're both working from home. So that is stressful. And like trying to find time away from each other where we can just like do something that doesn't involve them is quite hard. And so having that that we're both in these separate worlds but together yeah. is really useful. And also because he is like he is a huge football nerd, right? And he loves to follow the football, he loves to follow sport, and he's always following it. And when that was dropped out of his schedule, he found it really difficult. But now he's on YouTube watching people play Call of Duty, and like that's the thing that's filled it in. So I think for everybody, it's helping on like a number of levels yeah. to get a degree of normalcy. But Caroline, I think some people uh, do believe that playing video games is escapist, and. Um, really maybe after some amount of time spent uh, playing video games it really harms your concentration levels was that your experience yeah well the thing is there's, with, with any kind of hobby like that there always has to be this moderation thing and for, for example the game that i've been getting into most of all is um uh zelda legend of zelda breath of the wild which is this huge game or whatever um that you can you can kind of never complete it because it's so big and i went from playing for like two hours in the evening to playing for four hours to playing for six hours to suddenly when I go to bed I close my eyes and I can all I can still hear the theme music I can still see the visuals like it imprints on your brain in what can be quite a dangerous way so I, I had to like like restrict it back to being like this is your treat you get to play for two hours and that's it so mm. it's kind of everything else it's like with drinking with smoking with yeah. eating you know you need to be restricted with it and uh I mean, I think some people also think that it really um, increases social isolation and the feelings related to social isolation. I mean, obviously, you're just sitting in front of your computer and you're not in real contact with any, you know, human being in physical form. Yeah. How do you think that helped you in a time when everyone felt a little bit lonelier than usual? Well, so... I'll, I'll actually go back to my boyfriend again, who has been playing Call of Duty online every evening. And he is somebody, like, like a lot of like men, they find it, they don't keep up with their friends the way women keep up with their friends. Never. So like my emails, my WhatsApps, my Twitter, my Facebook has been like me, like checking in with my women friends all the time, seeing who's okay. You know, in the way that we do, we kind of like, you know, pick nits off each other's backs up that way all day long. And like, I don't think men do that in the same way. So for me, I was in the evening being like, okay, I'm spending two hours on Zelda, so I can take a break from caring about <laughs> all the people in my life. Yeah. And like take a break from checking in on my mom and checking in on my dad and checking in on everyone. And like it became a full time job is checking in on people. And whereas my boyfriend, who's playing socially, he's playing Call of Duty socially, he's somebody who who wouldn't have that contact with his friend. And so that's when he checks in with them. So he spends two, like he's on his headset, like talking to them about like you know, his friend's baby who's due in a month or whatever, or his friend's job and whatever. And that's when he's getting his social time. So I think it can be both. It can be the breaks yeah. you take from people and it can be your introduction back into being social as well. Mm-hmm. Why do you keep uh, mentioning The Legend of Zelda this much? What is so interesting about this game <laughs> for you? Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the, what, the, what, there's two main reasons why I love it. Okay. First of all, you get a horse, <laughs> and I just really um, like. I grew up in Ireland, and the horses were a big part of my childhood, and so I keep going back to it. <laughs> and um, second of all, it's something that it took me about five or six hours of playing it before I felt like I could do it at all because it's, there's so many buttons, there's so many controls. That thing where you feel so overwhelmed. And now I feel like it's like a skill that I, it's so deluded, but like it's a skill I have, like, you know, shoemaking or something. <laughs> I feel like I worked for something. And so now I'm like proud of the skill I have. I realize this is not like hooked into the real world and being good at Zelda will not help me. But in this time when there's so little to feel proud of, yeah. having, having like a stable of horses in Zelda uh, makes me feel better. <laughs> and what other games are you into these days? 
Well, actually, um, there's so many amazing independent games that are out there. And I think actually what can be the barrier with people getting into games is that they're so expensive. Like a lot of them can be like in, in, in British pounds, like 60 pounds for a game. And like if you don't like that game, mm-hmm. you can't really bring it back. So there's all these independent publishers that put out these games that are like seven quid. They take maybe five hours to play. Um, one of them is called Wander Song, which is your, you're just um, somebody who's, the, like one of those, the world's ending and you're just a singer who's going through the world trying to change the world with song and you don't hit anyone, it's totally non-violent. And it's just this lovely like six hour game you play. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another one that's kind of the total opposite sort of, um, outlook, which is called the Untitled Goose Game. If, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's become quite famous. It's basically, you're a horrible goose, and <laughs> all you do is you go into a village and you make life hell for people. You like steal things from them and just honk at them until they like run away, and it, that, that's the whole game. And it's kind of weirdly like, yes! Screw you! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there's, there's tons of games like that. Night in the Woods is another one that is like, um, it's part of this trend. It's almost like a playable novel. Like there's all this like, mm. a, like a hundred thousand word of text, but you're kind of discovering bits of text yourself. Okay. Um, so there's like, there's something for everybody. It was good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. COVID-19 has officially booted the 2020 edition of Art Basel into next year. And to find out how that affects the art world, I have advisor Beatrice Ridley with me. Hi, Beatrice. Hi. So, was that the right decision, you think? I think it was. The uh, art world has um, so many collectors from so many different countries who um, are at risk of this virus and an art fair has, uh, like Art Basel last year, had a hundred, nearly 100,000 visitors and so the risk of contagion is huge and the other thing to uh, note is that some of the biggest art collectors are in the at-risk demographic, mm. a lot of the, um, the biggest spenders are men um, age 55 to 80, so they are at risk, and so the danger was that no one would come if mm-hmm. they had it. Okay, so if the fair happens and no one comes, then it's just a financial loss for everyone who participated in, right? Yes, and it's, it's not a loss because there's also so much um, of the cost that needs to be borne by the galleries. They have to transport all the works, they have to insure them, um, they have to pay for the installation. There's a, a lot of cost involved in also getting a stand at Art mm. Basel. It's very expensive, so it would have been a, a big financial expense for potentially no return. But the interesting thing is they're actually galleries and e- the fair itself, they are losing money by cancelling it as well. So. Which one would be worse for the industry? I mean, it's really a tough time, but then in either scenario, I think a lot of money is lost, right? I totally agree. Um, it's one of the biggest congregations of the art world when Art Basel does happen, and millions are spent. And the fact that no one's coming, no one's spending, uh, hurts the pockets of many people in the, in the industry. You have to remember that the art industry is, well, it was a $64 billion industry with, you know, 330,000 um, uh, businesses operating under it and uh, at least, I think, 3 million people working in the art industry. And to have a fair like that cancelled will hurt that industry in, in many respects. Um, but at the same time, for some galleries, it will be worse than for others Mm. Um, and for others it will save on their costs Uh, but you have to remember as well that for many galleries sales at art fairs are pretty much um, at least a third or half of their overall sales so it will hit hard. Mm -hmm. I mean definitely the situation with smaller galleries is uh, very worrying, but then smaller fairs, and some of them haven't really been cancelled, they are worried about survival at the moment.
But my question is, do you think the bigger fairies like Art Basel, do you feel like they are immune to all this economic difficulty that the art world is going through at the moment? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, uh, Art Basel Hong Kong was also cancelled and put online, and that wasn't the same. So that hurts the art fair organisers as much as it hurts the galleries. Um, the galleries, though, can reinvent themselves and can go back to the old-fashioned way of operating, you know, holding shows in their galleries, in their premises, and more locally. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a, maybe a good thing. And also they are collaborating much more with one another in a way they've never done um, before, mm -hmm. uh, as the art fairs were so important. So, you know, galleries are now um, uh, collaborating even with auction houses. This week you have uh, the Dealer's Eye, which is um, uh, an auction hosted by Sotheby's, where 35 dealers have consigned 100 old masterworks to mm -hmm. the auction house. So it's a, a unique collaboration. Yeah, definitely. And we've seen a lot of unique collaborations during uh, this time span, I think. You said that smaller galleries can reinvent themselves. Do you think this can be the case with art fairs too? I think that with art fairs they're going to have to go local um, if they do reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. Until such time as there's a vaccine, I think everything is going to be much smaller mm -hmm. and much more local. When there's a vaccine, then there'll be a full recovery and things will be back in, a, uh, in full swing. Mm -hmm. But until such time, I think it's going to be a smaller, more reduced uh, art world with smaller local art firms. We've got the issue of freeze uh, in London that's coming up in the autumn and whether that goes ahead or not. Um, and whether they keep it just as a local fair. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see whether that can be reinvented um, as a smaller scale operation. Okay, so you believe that actually things are going to go back to normal in full swing, but I think some people believe that, um, you know, digital fairs, for example, maybe can at some point, to some extent, replace traditional ones. Do you think that is a likely scenario? Sorry, the, what would be tr uh, replace traditional ones? Online art fairs, for example. Oh, uh, the online art fairs will replace traditional ones. Yes, there's a huge drive for online, mm -hmm. and it's really interesting to see what's happening. You have to think that the art world really needed to be brought up to the 21st century in terms <laughs> of digitization, so that's uh, now happening. Whether um, that's the way forward to go online completely is a completely, other, a completely different question. Mm -hmm. um, this week we've got Art Basel online in the viewing rooms, um, we have all the auction houses also holding their um, auctions online. I'm not sure whether that's going to be really um, the remedy for all. We've seen that um, in April, for example, when the auction houses held all their auctions online, mm -hmm. um, they were down on sales by 92% compared to last year. Um, so that was devastating. Yeah. Um, and so similarly, just if you look at the online sales for last year, 2019, it was only 9% of all the art sales uh, in the global art market that were made online. So we'll see what happens this week for the online viewing rooms at Art Basel. But the truth is, it's not the same. It's not the same as seeing you know, art. Um, in the flesh, you can't see Olaf or Elias and the sun at the Tate, you know, on a screen, or uh, Julie Moretu's monumental paintings uh, through a screen either. You have to be there in the flesh yeah. to see all types of artwork. Um, and so I think it doesn't quite translate either for the experience, um, and remember that art is an experience and is increasingly valued as an experience. Yeah. But Beatrice, you know, sorry to cut you off, but I remember yeah. the days when people were, you know, saying out loud that um, physical books cannot replace, I mean, sorry, ebooks cannot replace physical yes. books because, you know, holding a book is an experience mm -hmm. in itself, but they really did. So, I mean, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the future. Yes. Yeah. I think that 
With books, I can see, because really it is 2D with books. I mean, it is the word. I know that there's a comfort of the cover and the physicality of it. Mm -hmm. um, but with art, when you have sculptures, um, you know, and take a random example, Louise Nevelson's sculptures, you have to see the intricacy um, in real time, in real mm -hmm. life, to appreciate it. Yeah. And it's also a social aspect. To go to an art fair, you go for the art, for the experience, and also for the other viewers and the other people that you might meet there. Okay, yeah, at least we have our silver lining there. Thank you so much, Beatrice Sidley, for joining us today. That's a wrap for this homemade edition of Showcase. If you haven't already, go to our Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube channel, and then go wash your hands. Bye bye.